Nicely sacked by Michael Strahan. I will always remember the Giants fans. Welcome to another edition of Giants Chronicles here on MSG. I'm Bob Popper from the Legacy Club in the new Meadowlands Stadium. Tom Coughlin was born in Waterloo, New York, and after a standout career at Syracuse, Coughlin embarked upon a coaching career that would take him from the college ranks to the National Football League. He started in Philadelphia with the Eagles before moving on to the Green Bay Packers. But then he got a chance to bring his act to Broadway in 1988 as a member of Bill Parcells' Giants staff. Coach, talk about uh, being a young athlete in Waterloo, New York. <laughs> it was great. You know, you play football, football season's over the next day at basketball practice, you're into it. You're Within two weeks, you're playing in a basketball game or a tournament or something. And it was a wonderful, wonderful place to grow up and great athletic tradition. Who inspired you to get into coaching? The guys I admired most, in, to be honest with you, in my town, other than my dad and eventually my Judy's father, my father-in-law, were my high school football coach Mike Ornato and my high school baseball and basketball coach Bill Carey. I was at Syracuse for seven years and then I went to Boston College for three years as an assistant and at Boston College I coached Doug Flutie. I mean it was a fabulous experience. Now you get an opportunity to jump to the National Football League. What, what did you take from your trips to Green Bay uh, and Phil Philadelphia first then Green Bay as a wide receivers coach? I had an opportunity to go to the NFL to go to Philadelphia while I was in Philadelphia, I had the opportunity to coach Mike Quick. When I went to uh, Green Bay, I coached James Lofton. So I had some, some incredibly talented people to work with. It was a great experience for me. So you get a chance to see the Giants on the other side. Now you get a chance to come to the Giants as the wide receivers coach and you win a championship. What was it like being around you know, that group with Sims and the veteran offensive linemen and Joe Morris, Mark Bavaro, you know, Z a lot of talented guys on the offensive side of the ball. What I really saw was the way that the organization was run, the continuity, George Young, Bill Parcells, Wellington Mara. In 88, we got knocked out of the playoffs. In 89, we were substantially in it, not quite there yet. And then, of course, in 90, we took off again. We were 10-0 and 0 and we were able to, again, some great, great opposition to win the Super Bowl, Super Bowl 25. At that time, the Giants were transitioning the receiving core and they had drafted some younger guys. Uh, Odessa Turner, Mark Ingram, Stephen Baker were guys that had come in to sort of fill the gaps with some of the veteran guys getting a little bit older. Baker makes a great catch near the end of the first half and, of course, Ingram makes that great play on the third down in which he breaks, you know, 75 tackles. It really, as a position coach, it had to make you swell with pride to see these young guys that you took as young players making plays on the biggest stage. Yeah, very, very proud of, uh, of the position that I coach, but also just proud to be a part of a, an organization and a team that really believed in doing things together, doing things the right way, being really team-oriented and understanding that individuals play the game, but teams win championships. As you're going off the field in Tampa, uh, with the Super Bowl after Norwood misses the field goal. Are you, are you having second thoughts about going to BC? Boston College offered me a job as their head coach probably 10 games into the season. I said, I'm not going to be a distraction for this team. We're playing uh, so well. And then they came back again and offered me later on. I can remember Mr. Merrick calling me down to his office saying, you know, uh, this is a great opportunity for you. The BC experience for you turns out to be great. Uh, you get that program back and running. You have the big win against Notre Dame. Now Jacksonville comes calling. How rewarding was it to get that team off on the right foot? Start a franchise, have personnel, you know, hire everybody that touches football in the whole organization. And you know, I, I looked long and hard at it, and it was hard. It was a hard call for me, but it was a, a tremendous uh, experience. It was a it was very rewarding, but it was a great responsibility. Boston College, as an assistant, prepared you for Boston College, the head coach. Now we go to the fall, the beginning of winter, 2003, and the New York Giants knock on Tom Coughlin's door and say, we want you to be the head coach of the New York Giants. What's going through your mind at that point as they're interested in you now taking over their franchise? My heart's racing. It's racing because in the back of, way back there, 
you know, 100 years ago, uh, this is where I always wanted to be. Unlike Jacksonville, where you built from the ground up, you got to come in here, and let's face it, in the NFL, usually when a team needs a new head coach, it means something drastically has to be fixed. It had to be daunting to know that I'm going to come in here and I'm going to have to really shake a lot of cages because they need me because it's not going well. Firm, fair, honest, and demanding. That's the code I've always operated under. When I accepted the position at the press conference as the head football coach of the New York Giants, the things that I said were the things that I believed. The reestablishment of New York Giant pride was the thing that we had to do. You hang together every snap, every play, and hang together and fight your ass off, man. We're going to have a hell of a football team. Do it. Let's have a team. One, two, three. Team. We had to reestablish the line of scrimmage. We had to become a team that won the physical battle again. We had to play the way the Giants were built to play. As you're going through your meetings in the offseason in that first year, um, what was it organizationally about Eli Manning that said, this is the guy for us? He had been scouted for a long time. Ernie had spent a lot of time looking at, studying, gaining as much information as he possibly could about Eli. Obviously, the family, his dad, Peyton, but now comes along the youngest and uh, you know, certainly a, a very, very talented young man in his own right, had shown the qualities of leadership, had shown the ability to win. How fortunate were you to have Kurt Warner here so that you didn't have to throw this kid in? Because, hey, you make that trade, you move a lot of pieces to bring him in, right. you know the fans want him on opening day. You didn't have to do that. Well, when we brought, when, when Kurt came to the New York Giants, and when, when Eli came, I told them that, you know, even, even in that first minicamp, guys, we're going we're gonna to compete for the job. You know, I, I'm, we're going to play this out, and we'll make a decision going forward as to who would be the starter. The decision was made that Kurt would start, and Kurt did start and played well. And then we got into a little bit of a nothing was going and nothing was happening. I made the decision after the seventh game that Eli would become the starter. wasn't pleasant for Eli. I can remember back-to-back -back games where you had two of the most blitzkrieg kind of operations in the National Football League coming after this young guy. How frustrating it was for him sitting in my office the next day saying, Coach, I want to be so good. You know, I, you know I'm, I'm disappointed in the way I played and da-da-da-da, but I want it so badly I'll, I'll get it and I can still see him there. Uh, you know, I, I hope you're not down on me. I hope you're not thinking about, you know, not letting me continue to be the starter. Well, I, I wasn't, but, and we knew that that was going to be part of the process. But uh, uh, we had two outstanding quarterbacks, outstanding young men. It worked out very well for the franchise. And as it turned out, very well for Kurt. 2004, and you win that last game of the regular season, actually in January of 05 with that win against the Cowboys. The Giants make the playoffs in 05, make the playoffs in 06. Early ousters from the postseason. 07, 0-2 start. You have a new defensive coordinator in Steve Spagnolo. You go down to Washington and you're staring at potential 0-3. How fitting was it that it was the defense at the end that gets you that goal line stand to secure that first win of the year? The way in which the goal line stand comes about, because you remember there's no timeouts. There's a minute and five seconds when, hey, it's third and 13 for crying out loud and they make a play to the one yard line they make two attempts at our right side and we make two outstanding football plays on that right side to hold them out of the end zone to win the game which reinforces the confidence which allows us to go we, we win six in a row right there I mean boom 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 
we get to Green Bay in the NFC Championship game. Welcome to Lambeau Field in Green Bay for the NFC Championship game. Second coldest game ever at Lambeau Field. Minus one degree with a wind chill of minus 23. My ears are going to fall off. Your face is... <laughs> well, uh, the face, forget the face. The ears were going to fall off pregame. Pregame. I'm out there and I'm going, this is a mistake. The game starts with the first message being Brandon Jacobs and Woodson. And what a collision that was. And we were standing there on the sideline going, well, we're into this one right away, you know, because that was some collision. Can you say that Plexico Burris had one of the great games no of doubt. all time? No doubt. When you think doubt. of the weather and who he's going against. Yeah. And the officials let him play, both they sides. Did. They did. They but did. was that one of the more remarkable performances? He's going against Harris, and they're just pounding each other. And I mean physically pounding each other. This guy makes 11 catches but it goes back to this. How does the man throw the ball that well? It's minus 24 degrees wind chill. And this guy is gripping it and throwing it like nobody's business. The game goes to overtime. Did you almost feel that you, man, we might have let him off the hook here? Well, because sure. you really outplayed him. Oh, that we're day. down there with, you know, opportunities. And first of all, we're kicking field goals and not scoring touchdowns, you know, but the one late in the ball game. You're talking chip shot. Not only is it a high snap, which is handled pretty well by Jeff Fegels, but Lawrence starts forward, you know, too soon. Then he tries to stop himself. He's got nothing left. And, I mean, he, he looked like one that I would have kicked, you know, <laughs> sideways almost. So Webster gets the pick. Now you wind up kicking the, the game, the longest field goal yeah. in postseason. In history. In Lambeau in Field. In Lambeau Field. So as he's running out there, what, I, I mean. Well, it happens this way. We get the pick and then we run it a couple times. We don't go anywhere. I mean, we're going nowhere. Whew. Now it's fourth down. And I'm looking for a sign. Field goal, I yell field goal. You know, everybody's giving me all this credit. Field goal, I'm just looking at this guy. He thinks he can make it. 47 yard field goal, minus 24 degrees. Ball hard as a rock. He hits it, he could have, it could have gone 60. I mean, it's like a rocket, Bob, boom. Kick on its way. End of Rand. Does it have the distance? It is good. Yeah. Yeah. Lawrence Tynes has kicked the Giants to the Super Bowl. What was it like as you get the NFC Championship trophy to take it to that next level? Well, that, it was a it was a wonderful feeling. And it's not out on the field where there's a million people. You're in yeah. the locker room. For the ownership, it was a wonderful thing. You know, uh, they uh, you could see the way that they felt. Now, for me, been there. To be honest with you, thank God got got by this one, but know that this next game is is really what our league is all about. You had fun during the Super Bowl week. You really seemed to enjoy it. Did you really enjoy it, or were you setting a tone for your team? No, I tried to enjoy it, and I did. I did. I did enjoy it. Beautiful day, huh? Great day. Great day. God, Bill, I know you meant it, even, huh? It's the greatest professional feeling in the world. The greatest satisfaction you ever had for one moment in time. Two points set. Brady gets set, takes the snap, back to throw, logs one right for Moss, touchdown! The Patriots have the lead with 2.42 to go. 17-14 in the final, okay? 17-14, fellas. One touchdown, we are world champions. Believe it, and it will happen. 17-14 to the final, let's go! What's going through your mind when the ball's going to Tyree? And he takes the snap. Back to throw, under pressure, avoid the rush, and he's gonna fight out of it. I can't believe that he's not down. How does he get out of that? Now throws it deep downfield. Oh no, not down the middle of the field. This is our last, you know. Wide up at Tyree, who makes the catch at the 23 yard line. When we talk about playing above the X's and O's, you have to play above the X's and O's to win in this league. There's the, the greatest example of all. 
lobs it left. First is wide open. Touchdown, Giants! In the left corner of the end zone! Touchdown! The New York Giants have knocked off the New England Patriots 17-14 as Tom Coughlin gets a Gatorade bath. But when it's all said and done, and Tom Coughlin is the head coach of the Super Bowl champion New York Giants, what rushes through you at that moment? You know, at that point in time, and I told the players this the night before, what I want in terms of winning the world championship is for you to experience the feeling once in your life where you are the world champions. You are the best in the world. You have paid the price. You have won the game on the field. You have beaten one of the greatest teams of all time. You are the world champions. Four years later, Tom Coughlin would once again motivate and inspire his team to reach the pinnacle of success with a message that would resonate throughout the entire season. You're going to hear me say this a thousand times. Finish, finish, finish. Taking their head coach's words to heart, the Giants would advance to play in Super Bowl 46 in a rematch with the New England Patriots. And once again, they would treat the fans to one of the greatest finishes in Super Bowl history. Into the end zone, a jump ball, and it's incomplete, and the ball game's over, and the Giants have won Super Bowl 46. Finish is what Tom Coughlin said, and the Giants have finished off the Patriots in the Super Bowl for the second time in four years. When you set a goal, and you accomplish the goal, and when you specify exactly what it's going to take and it happens exactly that way that is rewarding it's satisfying but it's also fulfilling there's nothing like it this is the reason for our success right here say something coach yeah. There's a reason for our success. The guy's just like this, the coaches and the players. Absolutely. That's the reason. One, two punch. Great heart, great heart. You played your asses off. You never thought anything but win. You kept on playing and you got it done. There's all kinds of obstacles out there and you overcame every one of them. I want to go in a different direction. It goes to Jacksonville, though, because it's something that's close to your heart, and that was the establishment of the J Fund while you were in Jacksonville, which continues now while you're here in New York. You've created many events. But talk about the creation, the impetus for that, and what it's meant. When I first went to Boston College as the head coach, I had a young man named Jay McGillis who was the starting strong safety for our football team in 1991. He played 10 games. We came back from a road loss to Syracuse, came back, and the trainer came to me and said, Jay, probably can't play this week. I said, what do you mean he can't play? He doesn't feel good, and you know we're going to send him to see if he has mono. Well, he didn't have mono. He had leukemia. And the ravishing part of that disease, he was gone July 3rd, 1992. He was gone. The idea behind this was Jay McGillis, and the Jay Fund Foundation was established to help families who had children with leukemia or other forms of cancer, how do we help them? We do all the things that fall through the cracks. We pay for mortgages, we pay for car payments, we pay for groceries, we pay for electric bills, we pay for funerals. We do all of those things. We have our ice cream social in the spring that they love. They come over here to the f brand new facility. We have a, a meeting in the auditorium where I come in, I speak to them like they're the players. And then we take them to the weight room and they watch some of our players perform. And, we take them over to the arena there and they run in, in the indoor facility and they're able uh, to see that and enjoy that. Uh, so we have a chance to show them our facility and we finish it all up by having a, an ice cream social and they love that as well. What does this mean to you? Once a giant, always a giant. Once a giant, always a giant it means that uh, you're true blue through and through and you believe in this team and this franchise and how it's been established, what it stands for. To be a giant means to be at your very best all the time. To have great pride in putting that uniform on and understanding all that's gone before you 
and, and the dues that have been paid in order that we can have the great opportunity that we have.